नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास Good afternoon, everybody. I want to uh, continue my talk uh, on uh, the same subject. I have um, repeated the things that I am going to mention in my talk today. I have repeated them many times and I have been thinking about them very often. More I think, uh, deeper my understanding of the truth that Buddha has explained in what I am going to say. As Buddha himself said, when you learn Dhamma, remember it and uh, reflect on it again and again and again. This is, I call like uh, chewing the cud. You remember cows chew and chew and chew and chew and store and store and then sit for eight hours and then keep chewing the cud. They do it every day. Eight hours they eat, eight hours they chew the cud, and eight hours they sleep. They divide 24 hours into three. <laughs> they have a very organized life. <laughs> so we learn the Dhamma and keep uh, organizing them in our mind and keep thinking about them. That's a wonderful way of using the Dhamma in our life. We learn Dhamma not only just to read and enjoy and throw it away. People say, I have read 20 Dhamma books, 100 Dhamma books. What they have, what they have learned? How much they have put into practice? Why? Because they don't repeat it. You got to repeat again and again and again to understand it and deepen your insight. For this reason, I repeat my Dhamma talks. You may have heard them many times. If it is boring, go to sleep. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If it is not boring, try to remember and think about it very mindfully. Yesterday I said this uh, practice, mindfulness practice, is a very special uh, training. That is why it is called vipassana, seeing in a very special way, a way that normally we do not see things. Today I like to outline both uh, Samatha and Vipassana as briefly as possible within the short period of time. So let me start with Vipassana, because that is the seventh steps of the Noble Eightfold Path. The last is concentration, uh, Samatha or Samadhi. There is no separate category in the three divisions of the Buddha's teaching. First category is sila, morality or ethics. Second category is samadhi. And the third category is uh, wisdom. But there is no separate category for vipassana. 
because vipassana is included in uh, samadhi category. So samadhi itself is concentration, is a category in itself, in the Buddha's teaching. And therefore you cannot uh, deny it, ignore it, bypass it, downplay it, (laughs) you have to keep it in mind. Vipassana, seeing things in a very special way, what are the things, when we say we want to see things in a very special way, what are the things? We see very many things in our life. (laughs) When we open our eyes, when we move, when we travel, when we move, we see millions of things. These are not the things. That is another very special thing. Not the things that we ordinarily see. But see our own body, feeling, perceptions, volitional formations and consciousness. These are the five things we see. What are the five? Form, feelings, perceptions, volitional formations and consciousness. These are the five. The body, Buddha compared to uh, F. O A M body is called form F O R M form compared to F O A M I spell it because my pronunciation you may not understand I may pronounce both form and form the same way <laughs> if, I, if I spell it then you will know what I mean don't try to correct the pronunciation but try to understand the meaning F-O-R-M is compared to F-O-A-M. You can see the picture, F-O-A-M. The body is compared to that. Why? Form, F-O-A-M, looks like a huge uh, pile, apparently. You can even take a picture. You can see a picture. But when you very closely look at it, look at it long enough, you can see them breaking. You can see them forming. When uh, a log or something is in the stream, uh, dirt and so forth come and collect, and then form begins to form. Many, many tiny little, 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 little bubbles build up, and make a, make a big form. <coughs> That's how it is formed. So when you keep looking at it, it forms, and then it breaks up. But apparently it looks like a huge pile, some object. When Buddha tried to explain this to a very learned Brahmin, and said, this is empty. This body form is empty. There's nothing in it. Then he beat his thumb, thigh very hard and said, this is my body. How can you deny that? This is my body. Can you hear that? My body. Buddha's wisdom was so deep, only today, when you take a very powerful microscope and look at the body, what do you see? Can you see something very solid in it? No. Buddha did not use any microscope. He did not put the body into a laboratory. He did not dissect it in the way we do today. But his wisdom, he was the only one for the first time in uh, religious history who saw the body 
in this way and said without any hesitation, reservation, directly, boldly, he said, this body is empty, made of various parts, elements, earth, water, air, fire, and you take one of these elements and analyze them. Eventually you don't see anything. You can bring them to quark, the finest visible, divisible form, and then you don't find anything. You just see activities, vibrations, movements, subatomic particles, even they are not real, really existing, appearing and disappearing. And for this reason, Buddha said, when we <coughs> pay attention to our body, gain concentration with this concentrated state of mind, look at the body again, without thought, without words, just be fully aware, deepest concentrated mind can uh, uh, penetrate this apparent solidity. The body seems to be solid. This is an appearance. Ordinarily we don't see that. That is why I said yesterday, when you look at the body, we don't see the body exactly as it is. Even in the mirror, you don't see it. As I said, your right hand side will be left hand, and left hand side will be on the right. It is very much like when you write uh, may, M-A-Y, may, and put it against the mirror, you can say yam. Have you seen that? Yam. <laughs> but you write M-A-Y. Or <coughs> you write key, K-E-Y, and for, for reflect on the mirror, show to the mirror, and you say, yak. <laughs> key, K-E-Y, you see in the mirror as yak. So even in the mirror you don't see things exactly as they are. You may try this experiment, you write <laughs> key, K-E-Y, O, <laughs> may, <laughs> hold it against the mirror, you see, yam or yak. <laughs> like that, you don't see with our normal eyes the reality. But when we reflect mindfully, you know, solidity, solidity you cannot penetrate with ordinary regular eyes. Only with mindfulness, deep mindfulness, with deep concentration, we experience this reality. For this reason, Buddha compared this to a form, F-O-A-M. Feelings he compared to bubble. Bubble. Uh, Pali word is bubbula. I think the English word came from the Pali word, bubbula. <laughs> English bubble, Pali bubbula. It is bubbling. It's feeling pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Whatever feeling, whatever sensation, it arises and passes away. This is not a secret. This is not a magic. There is no any, uh, what you call, uh, creation, mental image, but it really is how it is. Feeling, uh, any sensation arises, and if you pay attention to it, it passes away. Whether it is pleasant sensation, or unpleasant, or neutral. You cannot hide it. 
it is not imagination that is real to see this we don't have to look at i mean with our open eyes can we see the sensation <laughs> even if you take the body to a science laboratory and dissect it can you see the sensation you may see if you investigate and check you know object it moving because of certain uh, physical uh, uh, contact it may move you can see emotions and so forth through the nervous uh, the way how the nerves operates uh, that way you may conclude uh, that means this uh, particular object uh, subject mouse or rat or rabbit or whatever you use when you uh, prick a certain point uh, certain nerves that uh, being will react in a certain way showing the certain facial uh, changes and physical cha- movements and so forth but you never know what that feeling is <coughs> we have to experience it only when we experience it we know that particular feeling or sensation <coughs> and we can see it changing it doesn't stay the same for even two consecutive moments changing that is another way of seeing not seeing with the eyes that's why i said yesterday this very special seeing is not with eyes open but with eyes closed <laughs> what can you see when you when you close your eyes these are the things we see when you close our eyes third this perception it compares to mirage mirage is uh, uh pali word also i think these words came from pali mirage in english pali marichi pali marichi <coughs> in some of these days if you walk on the road you know paved road tar road or walk in the open area from a distance you see water when you get closer there's no water this called mirage because this is the decept what do you call visual uh, uh, distortion uh, that um, optical illusion so to say that um, the deer <coughs> mega deer uh, in with lot of uh, uh, th- um, sense of thirst thirst thirsty deer would look for water and uh, run looking for water and sees this mirage and he runs after it to drink water and he doesn't see water so he stops and turns back and see water behind so he walks back when he walks back and there's no water then stop and look the other way then he sees water there so this deer will run back and forth back and forth looking for the water and he sees water he cannot drink because when he approaches it water disappears perception is like that buddha said <clears throat> we perceive things in a certain way and when we very closely examine that particular object it is not exactly what we saw something we see very with our eyes we see something very very beautiful from a certain distance when you take a picture for example <clears throat> the when you look at the picture from a distance it looks gorgeous beautiful when you go closer and closer and closer and closer 
what do you see? All you see will be certain dots, arranged in certain way. <coughs> the artist take, uh, takes a brush and takes paints and, you know, throws something, and he goes back and look at it, and then it doesn't look the way he wants it, so he goes back and then puts some more paint, and then goes back. So from a distance it looks in a certain way. When you get closer, it is not that way. <clears throat> when I was uh, going to Vatican uh, once, from a distance, there was a man with me. I, I said, these are beautiful images. He said, they are not images, they are pictures. I said, no, 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 they cannot be pictures, they must be images made of clay or metal or wood or something. They cannot be image, uh, pictures. So the, the three-dimension pictures gives me, gave me the impression that they are images, <coughs> exactly as I, he, he has seen Vatican. Therefore he said they are not images, they are pictures. I have not been to Vatican before. When I got closer, I saw them really pictures, three-dimensional pictures. Similarly, when we see certain things from a distance, from a certain angle, it appears in certain way. When we get closer and look at it from different angles, it looks something different. Similarly, sounds, smell, taste, touch, and so forth, we perceive in a certain way, and when we closely examine, they are not that way. So the mindful meditator pays total undivided attention to the sound, smell, taste, touch, and visual objects, and realizes that they are not exactly how they appeared to them, appeared to that person originally. They keep changing. So that is perception. So original perception changes. As you keep examining it, it changes. And therefore it is called uh, like a mirage. The, the fourth is uh, called uh, uh, volitional formation that is very interesting. They are called in Pali Sankara. Sankara means conditioned things or conditional things or conditioning. Conditioned, conditional or conditioning. Uh, they sometimes are called karma, sometimes called uh, mm, conditioned, causally related conditioned things. So, uh, primarily thoughts. Uh, when a thought arises, it, it appears to us to be something very real. Thoughts are very real. So real that we don't want somebody to copy our thoughts. We go and register them in a patent office. Because if they are my thought. I put it down and no, I have copyright. I don't let anybody else copy it, because the thoughts are so real to me. And Buddha compared this to this called Sankhara. Uh, it is untranslatable Pali, Pali word. The word Sankhara is, cannot be translated. We had to use that word 
as it is and try to translate into English using different words and still we will not get the essence of the the meaning of this word sankara <coughs> sankara uh, i called it our backpack for samsara journey on the one hand we have samsara on the other hand we have sankara to go with samsara because it is sankara that pushes us to into uh, rebirth re existence and therefore they are called i call uh, uh, sankara our backpack the bigger the backpack longer the t- trip heavy it is short of the backpack short of the trip light it is in this backpack so many things we collect and put there to use on our samsara journey and would the call it compared it to uh, plant and banana tree not too many since not too many people have seen banana tree i compare it to another i use another simile that simile uh, anybody can uh, understand because everywhere in the world you can see that uh, that word that thing i spell it uh, it has a very deep profound philosophical meaning as well i compare it to own and own with i in the middle what is that onion <clears throat> because we keep going on and on and on in samsara because this uh, on and on on and on is the combination of three things on the one side one on is called greed the other on is ignorance i in the middle is ego i consciousness so greed is compared to <coughs> mother ignorance is compared to father the center i is there only child so mother greed father uh, ignorance because of these two their child is born child is called i the very moment we conceive in our mother's womb greed arises ignorance arises i arises so greed is in this simile greed is the mother ignorance is the father i is ego in samsara in sankhara these are the three things we find and they keep <coughs> going on and on in samsara and therefore both the compared uh, it to banana because uh, when you try to look at banana and try, banana plant and peel off to look for a core permanent eternal entity you never find it similarly when you try to peel off an onion looking for a core heart in it you will never find core in it you can keep peeling and peeling and peeling inside there is no one permanent entity in it similarly our thought although we have we are so proud of it when we look at the thought very closely very mindfully there is nothing in it <coughs> you try to examine a thought and try to find out and anything solid permanent in it to te- say this is my thought 
And that is exactly how we look, how we see the thought when we pay total, mindful, undivided attention to thought. This is how we see the thought. There is no permanent entity in it, substance in it. And consciousness, Buddha compared to mirage, uh, what you call uh, magi- magic, magician's uh, performance, uh, magician's creation. Magicians can make you believe that there is something. He may take a stick and uh, break it into two and pass one piece to this side and the other piece to this side and both sides will look at it. It is just a piece or two pieces. And he bring it them, bring them together and uh, put together and blow and then two pieces become one. There you cannot see the joint. He take a hat and show to everybody there is nothing inside in the hat. While you are looking at the hat, he put his hand inside and pull out a pigeon or rabbit. And you think this marvelous thing he does. He took a rabbit or pigeon out of his empty hat. But if somebody were to go behind the wall while this man is inside the, on the stage, inside the curtain, goes behind the wall and drill a little hole and watch this man doing what he does inside the curtain on the stage, you can see what this man is doing. So after seeing all these things, you get so disappointed. This is just a trick. There's no pigeon in the in the in the head separately. He learns a trick to hide the pigeon in such a way that nobody can see it. You might have seen uh, people putting into a box and cutting into pieces. Head one side, body inside another side. You know, in uh, I think David Copperfield or somebody, <laughs> a very famous magician. Uh, so he mesmerized the world, and in reality, that is the trick he learns to uh, deceive the spectators, create optical illusion. And if somebody were to go behind the wall and drill the hole and show what this man is doing, that person can see exactly what he is doing. There is no, uh, nothing of the sort that he shows to people. When he comes out, you ask, suppose the person happens to be your friend, you ask your friend, where have you been? He would say, I was outside. Didn't you, you, you missed the sh- magic show. Didn't you see magic? He said, there's no magic. Then you would say, my poor friend missed the point. We all saw magic. He said, there is no magic. He is so deluded. And he thinks, you all are deluded. He saw the truth. The man who saw the truth Other people call him deluded and the one who saw the truth calls others deluded. That is our consciousness. Consciousness is so tricky. We cannot separate. For example, yesterday I said we become mindful of our consciousness. How can we be mindful of consciousness? Because consciousness is mixed with everything. 
We cannot lift our finger intentionally without consciousness. Consciousness is always present in whatever we do intentionally. And it is mixed with everything. Without consciousness we can do nothing. There may certain things be happening to us uh, automatically sometimes when we lose consciousness and still certain things may be going on. We are not aware of it. and uh, But we are not conscious of it. But if anything we do consciously, uh, speaking, thinking, movements and so forth, consciousness is there. And it is almost impossible to separate. And also, all these five aggregates, we cannot separate. That is another tricky part. None of these aggregates uh, separate from others because they all work together. But when we are mindful, we can experience the distinction between one and the other. We can experience the body, we can experience feelings, perceptions, volitional formations and consciousness. We can very clearly, distinctly experience. What do we experience in them? We experience the same thing in every, every one of them. What is that? They all are in a state of flux. Changing, 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 changing. Never stop. And what is the use of knowing impermanence? We emphasize we want to see impermanence. What is the use? What purpose does it serve? Friends, I said that is the main thrust of the personal meditation. Why? Because when we see impermanence, we don't try to get stuck, we don't try to get uptight, we don't try to get rigid, we don't try to get angry, uh, disappointed. We see they are changing and we, when we see them changing, uh, we don't try to hold on to them. You know, we experience, as I mentioned yesterday, we experience uh, suffering because we cling to them. If we do not cling to them, we, ex we don't experience suffering. We let them go. As they come, we can let them go. We experience pleasure, joy, when uh, we see things are changing, impermanent, passing away, in a very deep way, we experience joy because uh, we see the true nature, very true nature of all these things. When we see the truth, real, true nature, there is no reason for us to get upset or disappointed. And that is why the Buddha said, whenever we, one sees appearing and disappearing, rising and fall of all things, every condition things, then joy and happiness arises in us. Seeing the truth, according to the Buddha, is the the, is, is the truth, knowing truth, brings us the deepest, greatest happiness. Normally that is not what you have heard. Truth is bitter, isn't it? Normally people don't hear truth is sweet. But Buddha said, Satchang have sadhu tarang rasanam, among the taste things, 
the taste of truth is the tastiest. <laughs> taste of truth is the tastiest. How can we see the, how can we get the taste of truth? Only when we see its true nature. So long as we have garbage in our mind, uh, we enjoy various things, but we do not enjoy the truth. I tell you one example. It's a very beautiful example. You watch movie, don't you? You watch movie. Uh, to watch movie, to make a movie really enjoyable, you have to have a dark background. When you go on airplanes, you know, we hear uh, attendance announcing, now we are going to show movies, please close your windows. Make it, they also turn the light off, and if you want to read, you can use that uh, headlight. And please make sure that there is darkness. Close windows. And then they show the movie. In the movie theaters also, I think the same way, you have to have a very, very deep, dark background. Only in the dark background you can see the movie. While we are watching the movie, all of a sudden, for some reason, for some magic, all the doors open wide open very quickly. What happens? The movie is so blurred, nothing you can see. And you think, oh, what happened? There's no movie. Now you see the light. Similarly, so long as we have ignorance, ignorance is compared to darkness. So long as we have ignorance, we don't see the truth, so we enjoy it. In the blind, we enjoy it. As soon as the light arises, you don't enjoy that. You have to have a total deep ignorance to enjoy pleasure, thinking and enjoy pain, thinking it is a pleasure. And Buddha said, one who enjoys pleasure enjoys pain. It sounds very ironical. One who enjoys pleasure enjoys pain. Yo sukhaṁ abhinandati, so dukhaṁ abhinandati. You work very hard to enjoy pleasure. And you enjoy, at the same time, pain. It is just like, <laughs> I call it, you buy one and get one free. You pay a lot of big price to gain pleasure. You sacrifice your time, energy, money, and everything you sacrifice to enjoy pleasure. Can you enjoy it without some pain? When you spend your time, you have to earn. You have to, when you spend your money, you have to earn. You, have, you will be tired. And so many things you have to do to enjoy pleasure. Can you leave pain behind? So, <laughs> remember, remember this. You get two for one price. <laughs> one for one you pay, other comes free. <laughs> what you get free, is pain. <laughs> what you get, what you work very hard for, 
is pleasure. To get pleasure, you have to work very hard. Pleasure doesn't come freely, easily, does it? It all, you always have to work very hard to get pleasure. And pain very naturally sneaks in. When you turn back, <laughs> you are enjoying pleasure. At the same time, pain also is there. You cannot separate that. When you see this truth, you laugh at yourself. And Buddha said, therefore, when you see the truth, you see this insight, this is the insight we gain from insight meditation, this is the insight we gain. This is not a joke, this is not just something to, you know, laugh at or no shun aside, but we got to think as very independent, grown-up, matured, intelligent, insightful persons, we had to look at this. Not that we want to completely uh, immersed in pain. Buddha's purpose is not that. Life has a lot of moments of pleasure. Many moments of pleasure. In Mahasatipatta and Sutta, he he showed 60 moments of pleasure every single day. 60 moments of pleasure. And if the entire life is full of pain, nobody wants to live. Life has a lot of opportunities, a lot of moments of pleasure. When we practice mindfulness, what we do, we recognize this. We recognize there is a pleasure and there is a pain and none of these things is permanent. <coughs> Pleasure is impermanent, pain is impermanent, and these two keep rolling, changing, one after the other. Then somebody can ask, then what is the big deal? If pain is there, if it is impermanent, what is the big deal? We experience pleasure then. But unfortunately, the pleasure is not permanent, it changes, and pain arises. And there is no end to that. This keep rolling, uh, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, keep rolling and rolling and rolling. Don't we get tired of that? When we get tired of that, what shall we do? We want to increase pleasure, isn't it? And that pleasure we want to increase is not the kind of pleasure we ordinarily enjoy, but we want to have a higher pleasure, a greater pleasure. So Buddha said, Tannang Nisaya Tannang Pahatabba. Desire should be overcome by using desire. What kind of desire we have to use, overcome another desire? As I mentioned in some of my talks, desire has two aspects, wholesome desire and unwholesome desire. Unwholesome desire is desire to perpetuate desire, increase desire. Go on increasing desire, bringing more desire. That's unwholesome desire. Wholesome desire is desire to be desireless. Desire to be desireless should be used, increase, in order to get rid of unwholesome desire. That is, through the practice of mindfulness, we slowly and gradually learn to reduce unwholesome desire and increase wholesome desire. Unwholesome desire has uh, pain, 
wholesome desire does not have pain in it. When Siddhartha Gautama, I just want to mention one example. When Siddhartha Gautama uh, attained uh, jhana after giving up all his previous teachers and so forth, attaining jhana was so pleasant, so blissful, so calming, relaxing, tranquilling the body and mind. Then all of a sudden he thought, ah, this is a pleasure. I should not have this pleasure. Even today, you know, many people think, I, I'm not, I, I don't deserve pleasure. People even feel guilty of having pleasure, for good reason. Similar feeling arose in the Buddha's mind, both the Sattva's mind, before attaining enlightenment. He said, ah, I have, I have given up my pleasure as a prince, enjoying pleasure in the palace, with all kind of luxury. Now I experience pleasure again, by attaining jhana. Then he thought, ah, there's a big difference between these two kinds of pleasures. That pleasure I enjoyed in the palace is carnal pleasure. Pleasure of sensual, sensual pleasure. Sensual pleasure brings pain. This pleasure that I gain through the practice of jhana does not have counterpart. It does not bring pain. It continues to increase pleasure. Pleasure of what? Pleasure of giving up hindrances. Greed, hatred, restlessness and worry, uh, doubt, and... Uh, anger, no, uh, sleepiness and drowsiness. When we give up this kind of, we enjoy this pleasure. We enjoy the pleasure of greed. We enjoy sometimes pleasure of hatred. Sometimes we enjoy the pleasure of restlessness. We, people like to be hyperactive. There's a pleasure for them. People like to sleep, there's a pleasure for them. People like to be confused, there's a pleasure for them. Ignorance is a pleasure for them. But once you give up those uh, cheap, unwise, unwholesome pleasure, you gain a pleasure of uh, wholesome, wholesome pleasure uh, that would increase your calm, peace, tranquility and insight. So, uh, that is the introduction to uh, mindfulness. There are countless things to say about that, but this is the first part of our, my talk. Second part, I don't have time to explain for the second part, explain the second part. Second part is concentration. I like to make it uh, short in five minutes. Not that it is unimportant, uh, it takes as much time or longer to explain uh, the importance of concentration. Concentration is uh, like uh, a laser beam. <clears throat> when you have a laser beam, you can focus it on a very tiny little spot to see it uh, very clearly and burn uh, whatever spot you want to burn. But for that you have to have clear eyesight. If the eyesight is not very clear, you will burn everywhere and uh, cause a lot of damage with the laser beam. 
Similarly, concentration is like a laser beam. Mindfulness or insight is like our clear eyesight. When these two combine together, you can get the job done. In concentrated state of mind, <coughs> uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, mindfulness becomes, all these things that I explained in this mindfulness talk, become very clear without words, concepts, ideas, uh, and so on. Uh, they all appear in the deep concentrated state of mind so that you are understanding insight becomes so deep that you can uproot the root of defilements. That's why the Buddha mentioned in many places when concentrated, when the mind was deeply concentrated, he focused the deeply concentrated mind to eradicate what is called asava. Asava means uh, inflow, influx or outflux. That means uh, uh, asava in uh, Ayurvedic tradition uh, is something that uh, a concoction uh, collecting uh, roots and barks and you know nuts and so forth you uh, pound them together you know take the juice and mix with water and other ingredients and bury in the ground for a long period of time to brew it when you take it out it be very powerful medicine on the other hand, it can turn into alcohol. Very powerful. You can get a very strong kick out of that. So, similarly, in our mind, we have accumulated all kind of psychic irritants, greed, hatred and delusion, all kind of conditions, over a long period of time in samsara, or even in this life, we have collected, put them, deposited, stored in our subconscious mind, all these uh, unwholesome, unprofitable, harmful things in our mind. When we have the deepest insight and concentration, we can go to the very bottom of this uh, unwholesome things and uproot them. And that is called in Pali Moolang Panyai Chindata. Moola means root, Panya means wisdom. With wisdom I, we uproot the root of these unwholesome things. And to uproot the things with wisdom I, we have to sharpen wisdom I with a deeper concentration. So concentration actually is one half of our meditation and insight is the other half. Buddha has explained these things in many different ways to many different people. Some people uh, need step by step concentration, meditation. Some people don't. They gain it very quickly, instantly, and that concentration is called uh, supramundane concentration or uh, concentration that uh, arises from insight. You keep practicing insight Practicing, 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 practicing. When all the hindrances, all the uh, fetters are subsided, concentration arises and that becomes so quick and you can see the light go to the root and immediately you can eradicate it. Uh, some individuals need concentration practice 
for long, long period of time and go step by step. And those who gain concentration very quickly have done their concentration in uh, in other uh, uh, times or in previous lives and even in past in this life they gain concentration for long period of time and then when the right moment arises it arises very quickly and then attain enlightenment by uprooting the root of defilements. So that quick concentration is called supramundane concentration, supramundane jhana, and the other is called mundane concentration, no mundane jhana. But mundane jhana has to be practiced for long period of time for one to gain supramundane concentration, and it. Uh, when you look at the person, in the person's history you don't find a moment that the person has practiced concentration. But this person has done a lot of concentration, meditation in this life or in the previous life or in, in other, other systems and then when right moment arises that uh, you know crops up and he gains insight and wisdom. So this is all I can do in today's talk and uh, I will uh, answer remaining questions tonight. And don't write any questions for today. Uh, we can empty the box and leave it here, and whatever questions you have for tomorrow, you write and put in the box. Okay? <coughs>